Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Chamber Connect series uh, is a series of webinars focused on bringing us together uh, to highlight creative solutions that we can adopt to further add value to the Chamber Network. Today's session called Reframed, Designing Member Strategies for Tomorrow's to Chambers is a topic relevant to absolutely everybody here today, and more so, um, more so than ever today in these current times. Our objective here today is to bring you like-minded peers uh, who will share their experiences and start a dialogue for collaboration, a platform for chambers by chambers. During our studies of the Chamber Network, it became evident um, that we're not as connected uh, as we want to be. And there is a lot of things that everyone is doing individually and separately, but we don't actually share this information as much as we should. And this is why the Chamber Connect series was created to hopefully bring us together and put on the table poignant discussions and areas of development where we can share best practices and really grow uh, our chamber ecosystem with the help of each other. Dubai Chamber of Commerce, with the help of uh, the World Chambers Federation, are working hard together towards closing this gap. We'd like to thank the ICC World Chambers Federation for their continued support in helping us to raise awareness of the Chamber Connect series. And together, we're working with ICC WCF to use such platforms to design and curate the content for the 12th Chambers Congress, which as we all know, will be taking place here in Dubai uh, during the 23rd and the 25th of November 2021, inshallah. So please book your physical diaries and possibly your virtual diaries, but we hope to see you all, inshallah, face-to-face -face here in Dubai. Before we get started, I'd like to bring your attention to some key interactive elements uh, of our webinar today. All delegates will have the opportunity to send questions to your speakers throughout the webinar. And if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a box that says, ask a question. Um, this is the question, this is the box to reach out to uh, the speaker, uh, our speaker today. We'll also be conducting a few polls. Again, that's at the bottom of your screen. You should see ask a poll or take a poll. Uh, please use that function when our facilitator introduces the polling questions. Uh, both functions, as I said, can be found at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the dialog box to the right of your screen, hopefully I'm pointing in the right way, where you have the opportunity to communicate with your fellow peers um, who are present today at today's webinar. And also you'll have an opportunity to download uh, the last post-show report of our last Chamber Connect webinar and uh, the Chamber Connect report, uh, which we conducted in 2020, which should be right here in the top left hand, uh, right hand side of your screens. Today, we are pleased to have just over 300 delegates uh, who have registered to join us today at the webinar, representing 83 countries. That just gives you a very small uh, sentiment to the importance of how wide the Chamber Network is, how vast the Chamber Network is, and how it's our job today, together as the Chamber Network, to bring us all together and share these best practices. And having our speaker uh, today is going to help us to understand what New South Wales Chamber have been doing and what advice and guidance that NOLA can give us to help direct us in the same way that they have succeeded. Finally, um, I would now like to introduce His Excellency Hamad Bouamim, Chairman of ICC World Chambers Federation and President and CEO of the Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry for his welcome remarks. Over to you, Your Excellency. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Dubai. It's our honor and pleasure to welcome you to the second session of the World on the, the Chamber Connect series, where we are trying to create new channels for collaborations and, uh, as my colleague said, knowledge sharing and constructive dialogue between chambers of commerce around the world, paving the way for the world's Chamber Congress later on uh, this year. I would like to share with you uh, three major points in my introductory remarks, and uh, then uh, we'll dive in in this session. Uh, first of all, and I wanna stress on what uh, Leila said, the Chambers Connect series built on a research we have done and continue doing to evaluate the impact of COVID-19 in the global Chambers community and assist chamber leaders to prepare for the recovery. We cannot deny the fact that chambers around the world are facing a whole and new sets of challenges 
nowadays, especially related to membership, as attracting and retaining members has become more difficult due to the current circumstances. And um, despite the obstacles, we have also seen a silver lining that uh, uh, we that's coming from uh, this crisis. First, uh, it has given the chambers the opportunity to go back to basics, reassess existing strategies and reflect in the changing needs of their members. This crisis have also accelerated the learning care for chamber and digital transformation, where we've been talking about uh, digital transformation for years, but we always have been uh, looking at it as luxury, where in reality now it is a necessity. And this is, we believe it's, uh, it's important to ensure that chambers are fully prepared for the future with its challenges and opportunities. And uh, today's, uh, uh, within today's uh, rapidly changing business landscape, it is important more than ever for chambers to innovate and adapt their strategies in line with their members' needs. And the shift of business activities to virtual channels, as we are doing it uh, here in the sessions, has changed the way we are also engaging with our members and our business communities, where we believe that chambers have become more strategic, are more efficient, are more proactive in their interactions while they are taking steps to enhance the value propositions to their business communities and examining new ways to support their members. So that's my first point. The second point uh, where today's uh, discussion is not only to promote these best practices, but also as uh, mentioned earlier, it's about shaping the agenda of the 12th World Chamber Congress. This Congress, which is set to be held in November, later on this year in Dubai, will take a closer look at how technology and innovation changing the way chambers of commerce around the world operate and serve their members, remove their trade barriers, and drive the global prosperity. The Congress, which is organized by Dubai Chamber, along with uh, our partners of the ICC World Chambers Federation, is under the theme Generation Next Chambers 4.0. And uh, this Congress will also uh, be held during uh, uh, what we believed here in Dubai is the great uh, or the global major event of the year, which is Dubai Expo 2020. And we hope to see most of you in person for the Congress. The third point uh, of my remarks is the fact that during this series, we look forward to hearing insights and experiences from chambers leaders about how they have adapted their membership structure and strategies in this new norm. And uh, today's session, we are hosting uh, my colleague Nola Watson, the new CEO of New South Wales Chamber with their new brand, uh, Business New South Wales, who in my opinion, uh, is one of the best chambers in the way they operate with, and that's during all the years of experience I have with them, being very dynamic and uh, challenging uh, the norm and taking big steps toward the future of chambers business, model innovation and ideas. And uh, I am sure that we will all learn valuable lessons about how we as Chambers of Commerce can drive a positive change and become more agile and competitive. On that note, I would like to express uh, my thanks uh, for Nola from New South Wales and to all of you for your kind attention and participation. And we look forward to welcoming you in Dubai for the upcoming Congress. Thank you and have a great day ahead. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, absolutely exciting times ahead. Um, so without further ado,
I would like to now introduce uh, Mike van der Viver. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I should have asked earlier, Mike. Uh, managing partner for Mind Meeting, who will be moderating our discussion today. Over to you, Mike. Many thanks, Leila. Many thanks, Your Excellency, for those introductions. Um, and I would like to immediately jump into things. Um, we have already learned who we are going to be talking to. We've already learned what the topic of today is going to be. Membership models with Nola Watson. And Nola, if I look behind you, I can see the iconic building of your city. You are in Sydney, right? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Good. Here in Sydney. Right. And, and um, we heard about the floods that you had some time ago in, in, um, in Australia. Are things, have things calmed down now? Yes, thank you for asking, Mike. They have. We certainly had a lot of rains. We've, we've had a lot of flood in, this, in a couple of states, but um, the rains have stopped and there's a few rivers. That, as you know, floods last a couple of days, uh, but um, thankfully no lives lost and property, properties are being repaired and people are getting back to normal. Good. Your, your office is okay. You're, you're not just having the screen behind you because, because, of, uh, because it looks <laughs> oh. nice. You, you really need it. Well, funny you should ask that. We did actually have floods in our office, but um, yeah. so a couple of floors were taken out. So, um, but uh, yeah, we're back to normal. Okay, good, good. That's good to know. So um, you are the CEO of what is now called Business New South Wales. That is a different name. It's not, it, there is, we, we don't see the word chamber in that name. And um, of course, this is, this is immediately intriguing. Why did you change the name with this brand? And, and, and that, and you, if you can, immediately, why, why all these changes in general? Why did you want to come up with a new brand, a new way of positioning yourself? Okay, well, I'll, um, the two are actually linked, really. Um, the, two, the two things are linked. I'll maybe start with an insight that we had in this organisation when about, about over two years ago now, um, we did a lot of we did a lot of more detailed research on um, on what was New South Wales Business Chamber then, and we found out surprisingly that um, of the people who used our services, and there's you know over two million businesses in Australia, and in a digital world, people can use your services from anywhere. Um, a very small, our brand, oh, sorry, of the people who used our services, we had very high satisfaction rates. So people who used the services of the organisation thought it was great. But the number of people who actually knew us and what we did was very, very small, sort of 2%. So mm -hmm. our members were reasonably happy, but if our mission was to be reaching out more broadly to businesses and helping them to become successful, then, you know, we were, as we say, the best kept secret. People, even though we've been around for 194 years, people weren't using us enough. So that was a key thing. Now that then led into, well, why is that? And what's happening with, um, you know, the chamber for chambers in Australia and how can we make it better? Um, the research around, to touch your first point about the change of name, we did a lot of research on the name and we found that with um, newer members and younger members and um, people kind of coming into the chamber movement, that the word chamber in this context, and this may be a particularly, you know, Australian thing, sort of had connotations, as it was said, of kind of, perhaps old men with cigars sitting around a boardroom. <laughs> and, and in our context, it was and people just, just to, just to ask to that question, fresh. Just to ask that question, there aren't any? There aren't any? <laughs> old men sitting with smoking cigars in boardrooms? Uh, not old and not cigars, no, no. Oh, okay. Just to make, uh, so, yeah, just make, sure, make sure, yeah. So it was more that the, the chamber, to be honest, in a, in a kind of regional areas, in country areas, where there was high street and local businesses that had resonance. But if we were talking about, you know, the large numbers across our major metropolitan areas in Sydney with, you know, 5 million people, that, that that word didn't have as much resonance. And so 
we did a lot of market research around potentially changing the name and um, came up with this name of Business New South Wales. And in fact, and one of our other states in Australia, South Australian state, had already changed its name to Business South Australia. So I have to say we weren't the first on that. Mm. But um, we found that um, that it certainly we haven't had any uh, pushback or negativity around that. Right. So, so with that, of course, you you haven't only changed your name, you haven't changed your branding. You've changed the way in which you work. Now, That's right. And, and I suppose just mean for your membership, for your membership model, sorry. I beg your pardon? What does that mean for your membership model? Well, we have changed our membership model. I mean, the, the reason that we did that, and I might just get to that, we found that people's views of membership was changing generally, that why people might have joined something or a club 20 years ago or an organisation that that was changing. We had seen quite a bit of churn so we were moved, while we had a roughly constant number of members of 20,000, we were losing up to sort of 50% over a five year period. So as people were dropping out of the bottom, we were putting in the top of the funnel. So we were keeping our numbers the same, but we had, we had around about a sort of a up to 10% um, people dropping out as members in the last few years. The third thing was we just, felt that maybe we weren't, why was that? Maybe we weren't staying as relevant and current. So we then decided that it, we would look, go back to basics and say, well, you know, what is our membership model? What are, what are we here for? Um, the membership, the membership the, probably the most significant thing here is that if we went back to our core purpose and our mission, it was to engage with businesses and provide them services that were useful to them. So a traditional approach that says, well, you have to pay fees to be a part of that organisation, we thought was not necessarily the way to engage with all of businesses. And we looked at also what's happening, you know, more generally about, um, you know, how people engage with, you know, Netflix or subscription services or others. There's all different ways that people more or less want to tailor what they want to get from a membership organisation, not be told that you pay a certain amount and you get these four or five services. So we decoupled that. We, we still maintain a, a what we might call the very large businesses who do pay significant fees because they get a range of preferential services and access to, you know, political decision makers. We do, but at the other levels of the organisation, we retained um, a capacity for membership of people who wanted some specific services and have been doing that for many years and were very loyal. But we then did something that was quite different and say, but we are going to have a, a, a category of free membership, that people will be able to join this organisation, get a number of benefits for free, but essentially, um, even if you're a startup or you're in a business that you're not sure that investing this amount of money is going to deliver benefits for you, you can join for free and become part of our network and part of our association. And so that was probably the most significant change we made. Mm. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to talk a bit more about those services in a second, but let's, let's proceed now to our first poll. Um, because you mentioned that in general there is a change in attitudes that people have towards joining or not joining organizations. So um, with regard to other organizations, and ladies and gentlemen, if you look down, as Leila said at the, during the introduction, you will see the appropriate button on your screens to be able to respond to the poll. The poll will, co will come live in a second. Um, the question we'd like you to ponder over is, have chambers evolved their membership strategies as fast as other membership-based organizations? There's all kinds of professional associations around. Um, and we would like to find out whether you think that the chambers have been as responsive as others or not. So if we can have the live poll now, then you can, Choose your answers. It's a simple multiple choice. Yes, no, not sure. This is coming live in just a couple of seconds. Um, it is live now. I hear from uh, the direction room, which is good to know. Thank you for that feedback. 
Right, you will have 30 seconds to answer this and then we will obtain the outcomes. Meanwhile, maybe, um, Nola, this, this general issue of um, a different view that people have of becoming a member of an, a, an organization, how much of an impact did that have on your choice of um, making available free membership? And has, it, has that led to any changes in your uh, membership base? I think it's it's definitely broadened our membership base. Uh, so uh, opening up to free membership, and we we don't have compulsory membership. I know some countries do, and some chambers. We had had around about twenty thousand members for a number of years, and within eleven months, we've now moved that to fifty three thousand members. So we, you know, significantly increase increase the number. Mm -hmm. and, um, and therefore the diversity of the types of businesses. I will probably talk about this later, but a key plank to this was also what we did in terms of our technology and our data analytics, so that in reaching out to members, we can tailor um, services much more to either sectors or where people are in their business journey, be it a startup, you know, growth phase or a maintenance phase. So um, yes, quite some different some different approaches we used them. Yeah, so we, we have the um, the outcome of the poll now, and um, out of all of the delegates that are joining us, fourteen percent have said that chambers have moved as fast as others. Fifty six percent say that they haven't, and thirty one percent is not sure. So how do you view those figures, Nora? 14% say that chambers have been as responsive and the majority says they haven't been. Well, as I said, this may depend on the organisation. It is interesting that, you know, nearly 60%, I suppose, um, say that they haven't been as responsive. I think, you know, member organise, a lot of other member organisations um, have had to adapt or they've gone out, um, gone out of existence. Sometimes as chambers, we have have a little bit of a privileged position within our communities. And um, perhaps that, that hasn't driven us as much to innovate as quickly or rapidly as others. But um, yeah, certainly most member organizations, even outside of these, I think we've seen quite a bit of change in recent years. Hmm. So let's talk about a bit about the services because your, your different model now is you've got Free members, in addition to those special categories that you have with, with the, the larger companies, free membership, and then a whole series of services. How, how, how do you view these services? What, what services do you offer and what kind of payment? Okay, so at our free membership, we realise that if we're going to have a member, it's not just like going into a bookstore and joining a club. There has to be a, a contract and an engagement. So to do that, we have to offer something of value and people provide us then, um, members who sign up, provide us with details about their company, who they are, um, number of business and those sorts of things. So what we offer all of our members, even if they come in for free, is access to um, a, a, a one workplace advice line. So we run a hotline, which is extremely popular and extremely valued by members. So we offer um, a free advice line call so that um, particularly small businesses can get industrial relations or other advice on that. If they want to continue in those services um, and get more detailed support from our lawyers or others, um, there, is a, there is a fee. But for every member, they get a free workplace advice line call. We give them access to some HR tools that are valuable to them, some current information around you know, pay rates and industrial awards, that, um, that we take nationally and provide that to them. And then a lot of content that is free on the website that they can access. So it is a way of people coming in, we can see what they use, what they're interested in, and then use that to tailor the selling of our services um, to them, um, you know, once, once they're engaged with the business. Okay, so and what are some of the paid services that, that are um in your catalogue 
Right, so our paid services, we've always had a number of these. Um, we have we have a, um, a, a law firm within our organisation, so we do have we do have paid services. People in, can engage our lawyers. We have one of the largest workplace law practices, um, which is you know very very core to our purpose and our mission, but something that is is highly valued. We have um, we have um, human resources services, um, project management, business services, a, a whole range of um, entrepreneurs programs, programs for supporting apprenticeships and others. So these, a lot of these at a, a reasonably low cost model, some are more sophisticated. But our, our, our business case around going to free membership, an essential part of that was that membership could be free, but we would largely decouple services. Because if people engaged with us in content, then they would choose a large, you know, we, we modelled on 6% of businesses who would engage, 6% of those businesses engaged would buy services. And that then would deliver the same revenue that we were obtaining from fees, but we weren't saying you join and here is what you get. So we were actually quite modest in our assumption, but that is proving to be true. Mm. Okay, so um, which of these services are are ones that are um, vastly used by your members? Uh, workplace advice line is, mm -hmm. is is vastly used. The um, the kind of networking and access to key people, and interestingly, COVID has, has made that so much easier. So we are we do have very easier. strong relation. Sorry, it's made, it's made it easier to have access to key people. Absolutely. So it's it, it's worked both ways. So we have always had good access to, you know, from the prime minister in this country and government ministers and, you know, key business people. Uh, but we, when we're running events, we could probably do a maximum of, you know, 200 in a room. Mm. Through COVID, our political leaders have wanted to engage with business because they were very adamant that it had to be a business-led recovery out of COVID. So our political leaders, because we have a key position, have been very happy to have um, webinars and others like this with, you know, 600, 700 businesses. But for businesses, particularly those in remote areas of, of the state, they would never have had access on a one-on-one -on -one in this kind of forum to put, to put questions to some of these key people. So that's been highly valued. And I think, as was said at the beginning, it's actually been a strange kind of benefit coming out of COVID because it's extended our reach. Right, right. And, and of course, the, the picture that you have behind you um, is, is typical for Sydney, but is not typical for Australia as, as an economy. There's a lot of remote areas. There are a lot of remote areas. I mean, a lot of economy, obviously, in the major cities. But yes, there's, a, there's certainly a lot of our members in regional areas and having uh, having the sort of access that we can get now um, through through the kind of digital platforms has been yeah. a key part of it. Sure, sure. Um, I'd like to point out to, um, to our audience that it is possible to ask questions to NOLA throughout. Um, you have a special button again at the bottom of your screen that you can use to ask a question. When you post your question, it'll come through. I will see it in the chat box um, and we can entertain um, everybody with uh, questions from everybody. That would be very useful. Nola, let's, let's zoom in on um, a special segment of companies which are notoriously difficult to reach for chambers of commerce, which are typically, you know, the small home businesses, the SMEs, especially the startups, young tech companies. How are you doing with those? Well, we're making headway there. Um, I think importantly, importantly, because this this sector in COVID has been has been really struggling. A lot of them, um, and and this new the new mem the, the old membership where you had a threshold that you had to come into and pay that before you even engaged with us or got any services was a disincentive for startups or people like that. The free membership allows them to engage, to ask questions, to get involved in discussions, interactive discussions. Most of those businesses are digital first these days. That's how they're building their business models. And so, you know, for us to be able to engage, to, to have that digital capability 
and interact with the, the startups and those businesses has been, um, you know, has been a real plus. I'd have to say the most important thing for that group is ease of access and also um, making sure that you are relevant to them. Uh, so the, the understanding where they are in their life cycle and what they need it has been probably the most important thing. Um, and that's going away from this one size fits all and being much more targeted in our, even in our electronic messages and our digital messaging. Right, and, and is, it, is, it, is it fair to say that that's a kind of, you know, virtual spiral in the sense that if you don't have any of those members, you, it's really difficult to understand what they need. Once you start having some, you can start talking to them. So how, how did you get those first ones in and how did you start finding out? Um, well, I think, I think the real way we got them in was when COVID happened here. Um, and coincidentally, we had built this program pre-COVID. And in fact, we're all set to go with a big marketing campaign uh, to launch our new brand in February this year, COVID, sorry, last year. COVID hit and we were just about to go around, go out with a brand awareness campaign. And we realized we had to change the message. We had to change the message completely. We had to say, how can we help you in COVID? What do you need to do to access government grants, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we did a lot of above the line marketing. So we did television ads nationally. We did um, radio, we did billboards, we did digital campaigns and we did social media. So there was a bit of a blitz. Uh, interestingly, the message changed from here's this new brand and be aware of it to here's what you can do. Here's the help you need in how you keep employees. Here's how you access grants from the government. So I think that's why we had such a significant increase so, um, so that's been how we, how we initially attracted that attention. And then we have since tracked the data very, whenever we send out an EDM, uh, a, a data message, we track how many of those small businesses forward it to another one. And we're seeing quite high rates of on forwarding um, the, the web links to other businesses. Right, okay, thanks. So we, we have a, a, an interesting question that's come in from Peter Byrne from uh, Ireland. Um, he's asking, now that you've become a service provider rather than a membership-based organisation, has that changed your position? Or has it particularly weakened your position vis-à-vis -vis political lobby? No, actually, it's, it's an interesting question, but I'd say the contrary, because um, we, we are still a membership organisation, so we still people still join as members, and as I said, they gain a certain amount of um, products and services as members. But apart from the traditional advocacy, they can access a whole range of other services. In terms of government, it's actually made it stronger because government comes to us and says, what's happening in business? What do they need? What are the, what are the kind of hot buttons? Where, where are businesses suffering? The broader our base and the more we can have data to drive that, we, we will run polls and surveys across 53,000 businesses instead of 20 and mm -hmm. we'll get much higher engagement because our digital capability is stronger. So it's actually, um, it's actually helped it, not weakened it. Okay, okay, very clear, very clear. You, you simply represent a larger share of the businesses now. Yes. Yeah, and therefore... And can, and can have a voice to them. Right, right. And so it's interesting to say to see that um, politicians have actually turned to you um, rather than you having to, you know, pull their uh, pull their coats and 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 get their attention. They're, they're already being proactive vis-a-vis -vis yourselves. Is that right? I, I think that's fair. I mean, we have had, as I said, we've been around a long time, and we always had good relationships with, you know, both state and federal uh, ministers. Um, you know, whatever their political persuasion. So that's always been there. During COVID, but everyone wants to be what we would call a retail politician. They want to be out there. They want, they want, they want the exposure themselves for what mm. the government is doing. And so the fact that we can provide that platform for them is, is actually gives us value to them, but it gives us power too. So mm. It does actually send a message to government that if there are policies that we think are not supportive of business and the economy, that to some extent we have a base to mobilise around that. Right, right. Um, 
Here's another uh, participant question, which we can tackle right away. It just came in. This is from Walter van Gulk from the Belgian Chambers. Um, and he's asking, is it true that Business New South Wales is not limited to your geographic area, but it embraces the whole of Australia? Um, you can have your members from everywhere. Um, and what has that meant for your relationship with other chambers in Australia? Of course. Yeah. Yes, no, I'm happy to answer that. So, yes, we can have members anywhere. Any, uh, each state in Australia has a, has a, uh, a business chamber. But um, businesses do business across the country. Um, a lot of businesses have, have operations in, in many states. And several, several companies, you know, join different, join multiple state chambers. Uh, so, and we have always, we have always had members outside of New South Wales, outside of our own state. In, in rolling out this platform of being digital first, but, and that being the, a guiding principle, we recognised that we would be drawing more members outside of outside of um, our own state because the border is you know it's is it's academic it's it's mm. it doesn't mean anything um, these days if anyone's running a business in this country and selling their products online they're not just trying to sell it in their city or their their state they're trying to sell it everywhere across the country so look in terms of how other state chambers reacted. Uh, we uh, there there was some concern, and there's probably still some concern, but uh, in in elements of it. But our approach to that is it is a it is a borderless country. Um, it's a digital world. We also are keen to kind of cooperate with other states because we see that the opportunity for having a platform to reach out is something that. You know, you, you, state chambers can cooperate and come to arrangements around how we could all maximise that. Right. So, so the whole notion of chamber, of course, has roots historically in some kind of localization, right? Um, are you saying that um, with your new business model, with your new uh, membership model, you sort of transcend that? Um, you're, you're putting a lot of, 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 of um, emphasis on the issue of, uh, of digitalization. That's right, we are. But what I would say is the beauty of having good data analytics is you can make it feel very local. So when we've, I'll give you an example. When mm. we saw a COVID outbreak at the end of December in a small area of Sydney, um, actually on our northern beaches, one of the very kind of, lovely areas of the, of the city here, we were going out with tailored messages to everyone who had those postcodes because we could get that out of our data. So while we might have members across the country, we could just simply tailor things, and that's not particularly difficult, but it is, it is a, digital, a digital reach, but mm. the strategy is around making it feel local. Yeah, okay, thanks. That's a really good example of how that works. Very instructive. Okay, let's let's um, let's talk a bit in general. Um, in in this opportunity that you have of of tallying what is local and what is global, um, what do you feel is is the the essential value that you can add for businesses? Well, that's a that's kind of depends on the business, but. The most, one of the most critical things I guess we want to try and offer to businesses is, is, is a voice, firstly. Mm -hmm. So um, a voice in, in not just with government, but in the community, people understanding more broadly the role and the importance of business, the importance of business to not just the economy, but the social fabric, because sometimes there are in, in you know, at, from time to time, there can be anti-business voices, Mm -hmm. And um, business can be painted as the bad guys. Uh, and uh, so we think it's very important that people understand the role that business adds to society and community. So it is a voice for business. And then secondly, we think that what we try to do is to, by understanding what specific sectors or locations need in, in business to, and, and to be able to provide some of these um, tailored products and services for them. And, and a network to engage, you know, to engage with other businesses on the platform. 
Right, right. And, and, and paraphrasing and tying into that, uh, paraphrasing a question we just uh, received from Faiza Ibrahimza from Mauritius. Um, who are your competitors? Well, I think that's a really important issue. Um, and that's partly what drove us. I mean, there's competitors everywhere now. The banks in this country are competitors. The banks are trying to you know, they're offering all sorts of services to particularly small enterprises, small and medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. um, Qantas, our biggest carrier through, it, through its frequent flyer program, is, is out there, you know, offering all sorts of services to small businesses. So a lot of commercial organisations, banks, insurers and others, see the value of tapping into small business and building a kind of lifetime value with those customers. So I think there's increasing numbers of competitors for the sorts of services that, that chambers have traditionally offered. And what is your competitive advantage as Business New South Wales compared to these other, these other parties on the market, so to speak? Yeah, I think, I think uh, we see one is our longevity that we've been here. The second we make um, quite a quite a significant, we're, we're very upfront about, is that we are a not-for-profit organisation. Mm. So while we might be, you know, selling services, that all of that goes back into the membership and, um, and is, is, so we're not doing it for a profitable or, or um, you know, shareholder outcome. And, um, and thirdly, that we do have the ability to, to change some of the, um, to, to influence change in the, in the policy and business landscape through our access to policymakers. So that's where I think we are different to some of those straight commercial organisations. You know, I think as chambers, we've got to learn from commercial organisations, but we don't want to be like them. Right. So commercial organisations, for instance, are great at looking at what we call lifetime value of a customer. You know, when do you get them and how long do you have them and what is the value of that relationship? We mm. should be doing more of that. And, you know, with startups, if you service a startup, a young company in people in their 20s and, or, you know, 25, and you provide a great service and they go on to be a successful business, you know, they, they will be engaged with you for 30 years. Mm. And so thinking about how we can build these lifetime value with, is, is, I think, a really interesting kind of aspect too. Right, right. How how outward looking are you? I mean, are you are you mainly focused on inter Australian business, or are you also offering services to your members who want to go outside of Australia? Uh, yeah, we've traditionally done done um, provide services to members outside of Australia. So we've had quite quite a lot of capability in this organisation. So, for instance, um, we found a few years back. Uh, well, it, a lot of our government services for exporters, for instance, tended to concentrate on the bigger businesses and smaller businesses, particularly in, um, you know, food and pharmaceuticals, not pharmaceuticals, some of the other cosmetics and others were not getting supported. So we, we have developed um, a kind of a, quite a strong export cap, um, support program. We opened an office in China which we ran uh, with a showroom there to allow um, businesses and would organise tours there. We had that running for about four or five years. Currently, we're not running that because this year, um, Australia, people may or may not know, our, our borders are virtually closed. People are, um, it's very difficult for people to leave. And we have had some interruptions to um, export. But supply yeah. chain issues have been a big matter we've got involved with. Right. And, and the other way around for incoming we do less around incoming investment, for instance. So mm. we, don't, we don't play in that field of inward investment into Australia. We more concentrate on Australian businesses seeking to, um, seeking to uh, export or go abroad. Yeah. Of course, in, in that, there's sometimes support around, um, you know, partners and matching where you might match um, your supply and demand. But our focus is more on um, particularly small and medium enterprises who are trying to get into export market. Right, right. Okay, I'd like to get into um, a quite a different topic with you for a second, uh, and I'd like to introduce it with our next poll, which, in 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 the, in the numbers of the polls, is this is going to be poll number four. I know we haven't done all of the polls, but that's uh, that's because the conversation flows the way it does. But in poll number four, I'd like to focus on events. 
And so, ladies and gentlemen, once again, um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see the poll appearing if you press the, the correct button. Um, and I'd like to find out from our audience first and then talk with you about that, uh, Nola, is what is your chamber's policy for online events for the coming year? Of course, um, online events have become increasingly important. While the poll goes online, um, we've got, again, multiple choice, three possible answers. And uh, can I get a message when the poll is live? That would be great, so that I know that um, we're, we can move ahead. It's live now, excellent, thank you. And the um, question I'd like to ask you, Nola, in the meantime, as we collect the results, is there is an enormous amount of online content. Um, how do you compete against free online content and make sure that your members are willing to foot the bill for the, the um, enormous amount of organization you need to do in order to get a good, a good online event on screen? Uh, well, we certainly have run a number of online events in the last year and will continue to do so. Um, we've, because of Australia's geography, as I think I said before, we're a big country and we have people in not just remote areas, but, you know, our cities are large. Online events have been very popular. I have to say that face-to-face -face is also popular and people are craving that again now. Um, we had a business event two days ago uh, that I was that I was at, you know, with a couple of hundred people and people were excited to be in a room with that many people. So um, we're fortunately we're now just being able to do that in this calendar year. But the online events um, are enormously valuable. Mm -hmm. But I think going forward, we will have a mixture of both because we see benefits in both online, uh, but also in face-to-face -face events. And ideally we have run a few where we've, where we've had both, where a large number of people are in the room, but we're able to um, then have an online capability for people who aren't there. Yeah, yeah. Of course, this this we hope this uh, this is auspicious for the conference congress we're going to have later in the year, where people will also be hopefully extremely excited to be able to get together in physically again. Yeah. Um, online events are a blessing. Uh, of course, it's it's incredible what we can achieve with the technology, but there are, is a certain added value to having the live events as well. It's interesting to see that in the um, in the poll, um, 30, no fewer than thirty eight percent of of chambers respond that their online events are free of charge, and only twelve percent are experiencing online event fatigue, and that and are focusing on other engagement activities. Is that is that similar in in your experience? Uh, yeah, well, we rarely charge for online events. Um, okay. Do sometimes have limits uh, on numbers, and that might be the nature of the speaker, or it might be a technical limit. But uh, and that can be, you know, that that can encourage people to get in early and register as well. Uh, but um, I think there is a bit of online fatigue. I would think in this country it's probably higher than twelve percent. Uh, but um, certainly going forward, having free and online will be the way that we'll do it. And, and what kind of other engagement activities do you offer your members? Uh, well, we've really spent quite a, done a significant investment in improving the content on our websites, having much more diverse content, keeping it current, as I've said a few times, tailoring it, but also some strategic alliances with um, other specialist providers that might have services that they, you know, can offer to businesses. Obviously, we have to do some due diligence there. For but instance? Um, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, it may be offering expertise in digital marketing. It might be we have done an alliance with um, one of the kind of global insurers around doing a diagnostic test. It's um, it's, it's one of the big international brokers, but um, being able to give uh, tools that small businesses can identify if their insurance is adequate or they're underinsured, some things like that. So just get people in to be able to use it and say, okay, not to necessarily buy a product from them, but to, here's something that will help me assess where I need to go. So we, we look out for strategic partners as well that can continue to refresh the content. I mean, one thing we have to do is measure engagement with content. It's not about how many members, mm. it's how much they're on your website 
engaging with you, responding to polls when you send out and try and gather data. That's for us the most critical these days. Right. So it, it is it is true engagement. It's not just the, the sheer numbers, but are people doing something with the content? Yes. Are they opening it? Are they forwarding it? When we want to gather data, are they prepared to come in and do a quick survey? And measuring our engagement levels, we think, really goes to the heart of, well, are we fulfilling our pur purpose of yeah. providing, you know, value to our members? And, and, and that, that leads me to a broader way of looking at that, not just in the sense of, of events or content, but how do you measure your own success? It, it's clear it's not just by, by the sheer numbers of members. What kind of metrics do you apply? Yeah, well, we measure all the traditional ones, I suppose, that most do. So we, we measure our, you know, financial outcomes, clearly. Um, and in that, we look at, you know, both both membership fees, but other, um, other revenue that we get from services. We did, and when we started on this, um, you know, develop a, a financial plan looking at a budget for several years, we think we're on track to well and truly break even on this within three years mm -hmm. uh, because we did have to make a significant investment in, you know, technology and marketing up front. We look at much more, however, at customer, um, not, just, not just satisfaction, but customer engagement. We measure um, with our key stakeholders in the community and in government and our political stakeholders. So all of those sort of traditional members that are normal businesses, not traditional metrics that a commercial businesses would um, would use. Mm. Um, the, the, the interesting part, um, of course, of, of, um, of a change like this is that you own, don't only need to look outside, you need to manage this inside. So can you, can you give us a bit of an insight into what has happened within your organization as you change the brand and as you change this membership model? Yes, I can. Um, I, look, we have a wonderful group of people and, and you know, staff within this organization and, and very loyal and very, um, very committed to mission and purpose. Uh, having said that, this is a big change. And I think we underestimated that. Um, a number of people have worked in the organisation for a long time. And while in going out with this change, it's actually been pretty well ex easily accepted by external stakeholders and businesses and members. But internally, we, we probably underestimated the cultural change. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have had to, you know, there's people find it hard, particularly going to a more digital environment, to give up on some ways they've done things before. So we've, we've, we've probably, um, looking back, we could have put more, more into that initially. Having said that, we haven't, um, we haven't had to increase large numbers of staff. In fact, our numbers are probably a little bit less. But we have had to look at different skill sets and um, how we use those staff. Some people have kind of adapted to take on different roles to what they had before, but mm -hmm. it is probably some different sorts of skills you need, but not necessarily you know, less people. Mm. If, you, if you were to um, talk to somebody from another chamber who would, was envisaging changing their membership model, what would be a piece of advice that you would give them? Well, I think, um, you know, the first piece of advice is always to, always to know what your members want. Uh, so don't assume that. And I think, you know, getting, getting um, data to actually support what you think is happening is probably the most critical thing to do. Mm. The second thing that, that I think is important is to continually test those assumptions about your members. So, you know, the world can change and you might even have data to support a business direction, but you need to kind of periodically review the assumptions you've made on which you're building that strategy um, and test that they're still valid. Well, uh, I, I suppose the way we do it is actually articulate the assumptions now quite re each year at our business sort of board strategy day and then mm -hmm. revisit those and say, um, are these still true or we thought these were true a year ago, has that actually proved to be true? What we thought would happen, has that happened? And if mm -hmm. not, why not? So mm -hmm. I think that's quite important. And I think, um, you know, embarking on any change just to assess as you go 
uh, and be, be prepared to modify it as, as you move through it. Because we've had to, we've had to shift. We've got the same strategy, but we've certainly have to, we didn't get it all right. You yeah. know, along the way, we've had to shift a few things from, from right. where we started. Right. So that, in fact, that, that preempts my, my, my follow up question, which is as a result of those um, reviews that you do periodically, where, where are some of the things that you apply changes while keeping the basic strategy um, aligned with what you had originally planned? So some of that was, um, I'll give you one area. So one area was in membership where we, uh, while we retained, you know, some of these old members in the old cohort and we have a free membership, which is can access products, we're actually looking at something in the middle now where people want to get a bit more engaged and perhaps for a relatively modest sort of monthly fee would like to perhaps have more preferential access to some of our events or greater ability to influence this organisation. So, the area I would say is that we think while we've started on this membership model and we're not changing it, we realise that that it's not set and forget mm. that you might need to adjust that. The mm. other area is um, obviously in the kind of products and services. We're much more forensic about knowing what people are using and what they're not. But and you mean not forensic? Oh, having data regularly, business data to say, all right, how many people really are, you know, engaging with this product or buying it? You know, if not, why not? Um, don't don't spend six months building something. Build something small. If it's if it's useful, redevelop it. In the past, we did have products out there. We would take a long time to build them. We might think they were pass or fail, where um, but we probably took too long to do that. So we're trying to be. Um, you know, more more commercial. I mean, we all come from everyone in our organisation and certainly all the board comes from commercial organisations. So trying to apply some of those a little bit more to the, the kind of membership thinking. Right, right. So we're, we're moving a bit towards the end of the session now. And, and, and in doing that, I'd like to lodge our last poll for today. Um, and and uh, it'd be interesting to find out if any... Uh, change in the minds of, uh, of, of people has already occurred. So let's ask the question in the next poll, which is after this session, I and I is, of course, the people listening to us, I'm convinced that my chamber needs to transform its membership model. And there's three options, agree, disagree, or not sure. Simple as that. So let's go live with this poll. Um, meanwhile, while people ponder over their answer, to this question whether they want to change the membership model. What has it meant for you personally to do all of this, to go through this change and and and, and having to you know, face all the, the difficulties internally with your staff and, and changing those skill sets and how's it been? Look, it's in, on the one level, it's very exciting and energizing. Um, on the other, when we change the brand and uh, and went out with some of these changes initially, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a certain level of trepidation because while you have the data to support what you're doing, you never really know how things are going to land till, mm. they, till they get out there. So, you know, to me, that's quite energising. Um, I think you learn things. You learn things about um, your ability to kind of use, use, use the resources of the organisation in different ways. So... Um, yeah, and, and, you know, there, are, there is some stakeholder management. So explaining what you're doing, why you're doing it, um, you know, takes, takes quite a lot of work. And I have to say the staff, you know, have been, have been excellent in coming behind it and, and very enthusiastic about the potential for the future of where this might go. Now, you know, we, we've made mistakes, of course. Um, we felt we had to do something that was different. We think that that is validated, that choice. But we'll continue to evolve and adapt and uh, probably continue to make a few mistakes along the way and um, hopefully recognise it fairly quickly and, um, and modify it accordingly. Right. So if we look at the, at the outcome of this poll, I think um, you've been extremely convincing, Nona, because no fewer than 73% of our respondents say that they're convinced that their chambers need to transform their membership models and only 3% fully disagree, while 24% are, are still on the, on, the, on the dividing line there. So um, 
what would you say to these people? Where, where, would, where would they need to start? Well, as I said, I think you need to... It, it, things might be different in different geographies or different stages of where chambers are. But, you know, start, start with who, what is your business community and uh, do you really know what they expect from the chamber? I think that's, that's probably the, the most important thing. The second thing, I do think you need a, a, um, a good technology platform. It's very hard, very hard to be a successful business these days or a successful chamber or successful anything um, unless you've got a, a, a kind of solid technology platform and increasingly a data analytics capability. It doesn't have to be, you know, super, super sophisticated, but you do need to use the data to make decisions. And um, so I, I, I think that's very, really important. Yeah, yeah, okay, very clear. So, so is there anything in what you've done that you think is particularly applicable to, to Australia that, that only works down under? Or, or um, do you think that basically what, what you've uh, undertook over the past years could be replicated quite easily elsewhere under those conditions that you just outlined? think Australia is particularly different I mean whether people I'm not saying everyone should move to have a, a category of membership that's free that's up to you know that, that might not work in all circumstances mm -hmm. but I think having a more flexible approach to membership and thinking more flexibly around what membership means and how you could structure that differently particularly for different levels of businesses and where they are within their, their evolution, um, you know, on the growth journey from startup to, to kind of want to grow or a lot of businesses that say, I'm very comfortable, I have a, have a good sized business, I just want to stay in business and continue to make money. Not all businesses want to grow either. And that was an insight for us. So, so I think just knowing, knowing who your businesses are, what they want, where they are in their life cycle, and then saying, well, does our membership model meet all of those um, or can be flexible enough to adapt to those different types of businesses. Right. And, and with hindsight, it's always, it's always nice to look with hindsight um, because that's when, when all the wisdom um, is gathered. But with hindsight, is there anything that you would have done differently in this transformation process? Uh, well, I think I touched on, I think, I mm. think, Bit, the, yeah. the broader number of staff is important, you know, bringing, making sure everyone and staff realises the implications for that. Um, so that was be the first thing. The second thing, we did end up having to kind of change our message straight away because of COVID. And so while we did have a big marketing spend and a marketing campaign, um, it would have been nice to be able to kind of stick with the original model, gradually build awareness around the brand and what we were doing, but we had to kind of adapt that. So, you know, sticking to a more ordered um, kind of rollout of that might have, might have made it a bit easier, but we, we seem to have come through it pretty well. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Nola, for sharing all of those experiences and, and, and the knowledge um, that you've gained um, in, in this transformation process. Um, of course, looking greatly forward to meeting you later this year, I hope, in person. Um, at the Congress in Dubai. And with that, I'd like to hand back to Leila for closing up the Chambers Connect series today. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Um, and, and obviously, thank you so much, Nola. Um, I'm sorry that we have to keep to a tight schedule, but this is just a sneak peek preview of the kind of dialogue and discussion and knowledge and thought leadership that we hope uh, the 12th World Chamber Congress will be the perfect platform that we all come together um, to learn further, to share further, and to, 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 to solidify this ecosystem and this chamber movement um, that we're working hard to creating together um, as a network. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for joining us today. And we really hope you enjoyed uh, the session and found it informative. I think it's fantastic that during the, the, the webinar, we received questions from all parts of the world. We had questions coming in from Asia, from Africa, from Europe, from our region here. 
We're really sorry if we were unable to go through all of the questions that were posed today, but that was just intentional to make sure that you turn up to Dubai in November, inshallah, and ask the questions directly to the experts who we will have presented um, during the Congress. Um, some of you are asking, how do I get access to this webinar after, after the session closes? There will be a, a link sent to all of the delegates who have registered um, and attended uh, to be able to gain access to the webinar of which you can pass on to your colleagues um, uh, as, as you wish. And also we had a couple of questions regarding where do I get more information? on the 12th World Chambers Congress, well, there is a dedicated website and the address is uh, www.worldchamberscongress.org. Um, so please visit the website. Um, we're constantly populating and updating the information as we have it. Um, we're still cooking the program. It's very, very exciting. Make sure you wear long sleeves because you'll be rolling up your sleeves when you come to Dubai, inshallah. Um, so we're really looking forward uh, to presenting the program, which should be on the website in due course. We'd love to hear your feedback today. And there is an icon, I hope I'm pointing in the right place, in the top right-hand side of your screen. Um, please spend a few moments before you leave uh, to provide your comments on today's event. That's the only way we can get better and improve and make sure we've got the right content and the right discussions available for you for our forthcoming webinars. Um, as mentioned earlier, the Chamber Connect series has been created uh, with our common interests at heart. And we've all said this today, uh, by running these webinars, we hope to bridge our network as well as create a platform for increased collaboration and communication. With that in mind, before we leave today, because uh, we've spoken about it, uh, about the 12th World Chambers Congress, but we'd like to show you a short video which provides a sneak preview of what you can expect at the forthcoming Congress. Um, let's play video, please. That just gives you a sneak peek, as I said, of what to expect when you come uh, to D uh, Dubai, inshallah, later on this year. Added on to the Congress, as His Excellency mentioned, the opportunity to visit uh, the Dubai Expo uh, 2020, which is taking place simultaneously. So uh, a lot to do, a lot to see. Um, look, before we leave, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Nola Watson again um, and Mike for joining us today. And we really do hope that all the delegates enjoyed the session, found it informative and are able to take uh, what we've learned today back to their offices and see what we can do um, to improve what we're currently doing. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Our next topic, which we're cooking at the moment, is on advocacy. So uh, dates and further information shall be sent through to you guys shortly. Um, thank you very, very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Goodbye. Stay safe.